about time that we can get started. Um, welcome everyone. I hope we are having a good Thursday. Um, my name is Alicia Adolph and I'm the AmeriCorps Public Allies intern for Arizona Preservation Foundation. And um, I welcome you to this webinar. Um, this will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel, which I'll put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Um, and make sure to put your questions in the chat as you have them. And I will pass it over to Donna Reiner. Good afternoon. I have had the pleasure actually for the last two years of supervising Alicia as being the public ally intern with our organization. I happen to be on the board. I don't know how many years I've been on the board, but that's neither here nor there. And we're quite pleased this whole series originally started during COVID, and we decided we would offer webinars, the preservation in place, and it's actually taken off and we've have quite an extensive series that you can find on our YouTube, just in case you've missed any of them. So I want to proceed because there's a lot of information today. Um, I'm pleased to present as our moderator today, Kathy uh, Nagawa. She's an associate professor in Asian Pacific American Studies and the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. But she is also a native Arizonan and a third generation Japanese American. Her family was part of the historic Japanese flower farms in South Phoenix, and she continues to operate the last remaining flower shop from that era, Baseline Flowers. And Here's Kathy. Thank you so much, Donna, and thank you. This is such an exciting program. So I have the pleasure of introducing each of the speakers, and so I'll do so right before they speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Kristen Lyon. Kristen M. Lyon is the director of the Honors College and a professor of history at Southern Oregon University. She specializes in public history and Asian American history, as well as issues of immigration and citizenship law. She is the author of Prisons and Patriots, Japanese American Wartime Citizenship, Civil Disobedience, and Historical Memory. This book provides a detailed account of 41 Nisei, second generation Japanese Americans, known as the Tucsonians, who were imprisoned for resisting the draft during World War II. Kirsten Lyon parallels their courage as resistors with that of civil rights hero Gordon Hirabayashi, well known for his legal battle against curfew and internment, who also resisted the draft. These dual stories highlight the intrinsic relationship between the rights and the obligations of citizenship, particularly salient in times of war. Please welcome Kristen. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, quite an honor to be here. Um, I'd like to share some photos um, to help guide our conversation. And I welcome any questions you have after I'm done. So um, my presentation is about the wartime resistors of conscience that were imprisoned at the Catalina Federal Honor Camp on Mount Lemmon. Um, and that particular site is known now as the Gordon Harabashi Recreation Site. And that site preserves the stories in, a, in, in an interpretive kiosk about those who built the highway up Mount Lemmon. And that includes Japanese Americans, as well as um, Hopi resistors, um, Fellowship of Reconciliation resistors, and Jehovah's Witnesses, among others. So um, the highway, if any of you have been up there, creates quite a, a respite for um, people who are suffering from the heat in the valley. Um, it was something that was dreamed up as a part of the Good Roads Movement in the 1930s um, to not only create some sort of opportunity for um, the people who lived in Tucson to enjoy the cooler temperatures of Mount Lemmon in a way that was a little bit easier than going around the backside, which is quite a rough road. Um, I've taken it myself just to see what it was like, and it's pretty tough to get up there. Um, so the idea was to create a good road to get up to the mountains so that people could enjoy the cooler climate. Um, but also to create some sort of uh, meaningful work for people who were low level um, prisoners. We're talking about people imprisoned for tax evasion or immigration violations, 
um, or Native Americans who had violated certain kinds of alcohol laws on reservations. Um, after the first part of the road had been built, then a more permanent camp was created about halfway up the mountain, and that's where the resistors of conscience were housed and where they worked during World War II. Um, so this is a um, federal prison um, photograph from the National Archives. So um, building that road was a very difficult endeavor. Um, it was done over many decades. And here's a timeline of the road. Um, so the 1930s, it was um, begun with a um, camp just to vary the bottom of the, of the highway. Um, inmates were kept in tents. And then in 1939, the more permanent camp um, was built halfway up the mountain. Between 1939 and 1946 is the wartime era where the camp held um, additional federal um, honorary uh, level prisoners, um, draft resistors and conscientious objectors. In 1951, the highway was completed, but that particular camp continued to serve as a juvenile offenders camp. Um, it was eventually handed over to the state of Arizona it became a youth rehabilitation center, and then eventually in the mid seventies was raised. Um, Mary Farrell among others, but I always point to Mary Farrell because she's the person who brought me onto the project, was the archeologist for the forest when it was discovered that Gordon Hirabayashi had served time in this particular camp. And so to honor that the site was renamed in honor of Gordon Hirabayashi and was transformed into a recreation site. Um, there is still work that needs to be done. The site is not on the, the list of national historic sites. Um, and so there's an opportunity to continue to um, do work to further preserve the site. And there are elements that are still remaining. If you were to go up um, to the site where the Gordon Hare Bayashi Recreation Site is, you can see this feature that's probably the most prominent. It's the stairway that went up to the administration building. Um, but my story for today will preserve or will focus on the stories of the people who were there. I'm not an archeologist and I'm not an official preservationist. Um, instead, I tell the stories behind the sites that help uh, bring those sites to life. And as a public historian, I'll say that um, being able to stand on the place where history happened really melts time and space. And I think the preservation of those sites is really critical to helping us remember and understand what happened in the past and why it's so important. Um, and I think most people don't realize that there is a Japanese American related site in Tucson. So this is the map of the camp. Um, this is the era that I would call the segregation era from 1939 to 1942. Um, just to highlight the fact that there were other wartime resistors there as well. Um, there was some um, disagreements and maybe even some fights between uh, prisoners who didn't wanna be all housed together. And so for the first time between 1939 and 1942, prisoners were segregated into groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses were held separately. And um, for the first time, they actually started segregating people by race in the camp. Gordon Herbashi is the most well-known prisoner at the camp. Um, he was imprisoned for losing his cases before the Supreme Court um, in 1943. He challenged originally um, or he intended to challenge the exclusion order, but in the process it became known um, by FBI investigators that he had also violated curfew orders and because he felt that those were just unjust because they were racially based laws. Um, the other group that's also uh, well known for being in prison there were the self-named Tucsonians. And these were draft resistors from Amache um, that was in Colorado, that particular uh, wartime internment camp, Topaz, and um, there was also uh, one individual who came from Arizona. So I want to talk a little bit about what led somebody like Gordon Harabayashi to take the strong stand that he took, um, because I think it's really important to look at where that kind of um, fortitude and courage to resist um, a wartime law came from. So uh, Gordon Hirabayashi was the son of Issei pioneers. Um, he was second generation Japanese Americans. 
His parents came from Japan and settled in Seattle, Washington. And this is his family. Um, the business partners of his father and others created the White River Garden Corporation. And when they created this corporation, it was at a time when um, people who are not citizens who are of Japanese ancestry were forbidden from owning property in the United States. And so they put this property in the names of their American born children who were citizens. And that became challenged legally. Um, the alien land laws that said that if you were not eligible for citizenship in the United States, meaning if you were not white or of African descent um, and could never become a citizen, that you couldn't own land. Um, but they had put it in their children's name, which should have been legal, but they were minors, and it was clear that they had done so to try and get around the alien land law to establish their business. Um, the court case found that, in fact, they had um, violated the law, and so their land was confiscated, and for the rest of the life of the business, they had to lease it back from the state of Washington. So I say this because Gordon Harbaugh, she grew up knowing well um, the limitations that a race-based legal system in the United States um, created, but he also learned from his father that his own conscience should drive everything he did. And in college, and this is from his own story, he said that he came to his own awareness of his responsibility to resist unjust laws by being a university student at the University of Washington and by going to a New York City leadership conference. This is a picture of him um, quite famously learning how to hitchhike for the first time, and this becomes important in his wartime story as well. So he went to New York City and learned how to be a leader with people who were at the forefront of um, the resistance movement, the peace movement, um, the fellow Fellowship of Reconciliation folks. And then he came back to the University of Washington and became quite involved um, with the YMCA and with efforts to address problems of minority groups in Seattle. When war struck, um, he was quite aware of the um, laws that um, had been implemented to force everyone um, to follow curfew only if you were of Japanese ancestry. And um, he said that at first he obeyed, and then when he was with friends studying um, for his classes at the university library, and they all tried to help him. These were mostly non-Japanese friends. Um, they said, you know, you gotta get back, it's curfew. And he started to head back and he realized, why am I leaving my study group? I'm The only reason why I'm doing that is because I've, I've, I'm of Japanese ancestry and this is unconstitutional. And so he said, I'm not doing it anymore, I resist. So he went back to the library and continued to live his life. When it became clear that the exclusion order was going to force everybody of Japanese ancestry out of their homes and into unlivable conditions, um, he developed a plan to resist formally in the hopes of creating a test case. And he wrote a statement that he took with him when he turned himself into the FBI to resist. And this is a very long document, um, but I'll just say that the, the portion that was really salient to me were a couple of points. He had been and helped um, families move into the relocation centers, the um, temporary assembly centers to organize people to move into the more permanent um, incarceration sites. And he saw the conditions that people were living in and the stress that people were going through. And he believed that this was completely counter to living any kind of flourishing life. And he said, this is wrong. These are the principles that, cut a, cut a, that go against what it means to be um, free in the society. Um, and he said that it's because of these um, laws that contradict the natural law of life that he said he has to resist. It is in, in, um, in the spirit of making sure that he doesn't go along with anything that represents an unjust law. And so he um, lost his case, long story uh, short, lost the case before the Supreme Court. Um, because the Supreme Court threw out the case against exclusion and incarceration and only looked at the curfew order in his particular case. And they said that following curfew, even if it is race-based, is a pretty low bar to ask citizens to do in contribution toward the war effort. And so unanimously, um, they voted to uphold his conviction. 
Um, he had he did not want to spend his time in an wall what he called a walled institution in an indoor institution so he requested to be able to uh, serve his time in an outdoor road camp that means he had to go from i don't know if you can see my pointer or not um but all the way up in the state of washington all the way down to the catalina road camp um the judge said that would be fine but we have no way to get you there he said if i can serve my time there i will get myself there and so he hitchhiked quite famously. Um, and he said it wasn't until after the war that he realized he had hitchhiked all the way through what was supposed supposed to be the exclusion zone. When he arrived, um, he worked on the road camp with others, um, but really sought an opportunity to do something else, wasn't really excited about the road camp work. And so he um, was able to get a job working as a baker. And he said, if you're a baker and making pies and sweets in a prison, uh, you can really gain favor with the other prisoners. When he left, um, he had a new suit as all prisoners did and got on a Greyhound bus that took him back um, to the state of Washington. Actually, I think he was in Eastern Oregon working um, with the Quakers to help people get resettled and uh, rode a bus again, all the way through the exclusion zone. Um, taking a bit of pleasure and being able to freely go places where Japanese Americans were still excluded from being. His time in prison taught him a lot um, about other people's ideas about conscientious subjection. Um, he served time in the prison with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and with people who are intellectual resistors to the draft, um, people who are associated with a Fellowship of Reconciliation. And it solidified even further his commitment to only agreeing with those things that felt right in, in accordance with his own conscience. And so after he left the prison and received um, this particular survey that all Japanese Americans received in the camps and out of the camps, um, and it asked him to fill this out in accordance with um, processes that would become important for the draft, he's, he refused. And the reason why he refused is because at the top, it says statement of United States citizen of Japanese ancestry, because apparently this was only asked to people of Japanese ancestry in relation to the draft. And he also was a Quaker and um, uh, was a conscientious objector. He refused to fill this out. And so instead of being processed as a conscientious objector or a Quaker um, regarding the draft, he was charged again with draft, ev draft evasion and was sent back to prison a second time. Um, he served with the Mount, um, excuse me. Um, oh, I'm totally blanking. <laughs> um, with, those, with those resistors, yeah, from Heart Mountain, um, who are probably the most well-known Japanese American draft resistors in McNeil Island. And this is a lesser known part of Gordon Hirabashi's story. So the following year, um, additional Japanese Americans um, were sent to Tucson. And these were individuals who were in their 20s, similar to Gordon Hirabayashi in terms of age. Um, they were housed in Topaz and Granada with their families after being relocated um, and forced into incarceration camps without due process. Um, these were young men who, in some cases, in one case in particular, owned um, or worked on farms in California. Um, Yoshi Kubo was one in particular who owned his farm and should have been able to um, get a, an agricultural deferment to work on his farm to contribute to the war effort. Um, but instead, because he was of Japanese ancestry, was not allowed outside of the camp and was not given a deferment as far as the draft goes. Um, in 1944, Japanese Americans were sent draft notices. This, this goes uh, skips past a lot of the, the very interesting history that leads up to that. But in the interest of time, I'll just say that they um, were sent draft notices and um, only into segregated units in the military. And so from a less intellectual perspective, um, the draft resistors from Topaz and Amache, or also known as Granada, um, refused 
And they said, we're not going to do this. Um, if we are not respected as full citizens enough not to be in, in these detention facilities, in these prisons without any due process, then how could we possibly be asked to serve in the military? It doesn't seem right to us. We refuse. And so this is just some pictures. Um, the first resistor from Topaz, Ken um, Yoshida, said that when the marshal came to take him to prison for resisting the draft, he, he said that he walked into his barracks and he said, is this what it's like all the time? He said, I don't blame you for not complying with the draft. I wouldn't either. Um, so the way that they got to Tucson was um, first going to um, county jails while they waited for their particular day in court. And this is a picture of some of the draft resistors from Colorado, from Amache. And um, I, I had the pleasure of reading some of the diaries and also some of the comic books of some of the draft resistors. Um, some of the, the individuals who resisted the draft, in particular, the brother of Ken Yoshida, found the conditions to be so horrible in county jail that they gave up their fight and said, I'll go into the military if that's what will get me out of here. Um, and the judges did offer the resistors the opportunity to evade conviction if they would agree to go into military service. Joe Norikani is one of the individuals who I interviewed um, who served his prison sentence in Tucson. And he said he always thought that um, it was just in cartoons that prisoners broke rocks until he got to Tucson, um, where indeed that was his job, was to bust rocks to build the road. Ken Yoshida, on the other hand, um, got the opportunity to work on the blasting crew and learned how to set and explode um, dynamite um, to clear sections of the road. And he was quite pleased with himself when he talked about uh, his job, they would set the dynamite, he figured out how to string multiple charges together so they could blast larger sections, take a nap under the trees in the shade until they needed to get to the next section. He said it was, it was great. Most of the resistors story talk about not only the work, but they also talked about the fun times they had, the connections they had with others, the jokes they played on each other, um, and their time playing, uh, softball or baseball. Um, one time in particular stood out that they played a team from the University of Arizona. They continued to stay together um, as a self-identified group that called themselves the Tucsonians for years after the war. Um, they got together with reunions with their wives and families. Um, and in 1960 even had um, some of the Hopi resistors who they had been in um, Tucson with join them uh, for their anniversary celebration. I got the opportunity to resist those who were surviving members of the Tucsonians and Gordon Hirabayashi um, when the site itself was rededicated in honor of Gordon Hirabayashi. Um, one of the outstanding documents that I got to take a look at was Joe, Joe Norikani's diary. And in it, he wrote, if we just left a, he, he said um, he didn't feel that people would really understand what he was doing at the time, didn't really expect a fair hearing in court, um, didn't really expect fellow Japanese Americans to understand why he'd resisted. But he said, if we just leave a footprint in the sand of time, then maybe someday people will understand. And so today, the um, the site remains as a, a tribute, not only to Gordon Hirabayashi, but all of the Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, you, you cut out a little bit there at the end, so we missed your final line. So, did I mute myself? I think just a little. <laughs> How long have I been muted? I it was just... only just at the very, very end. So I think for your final <laughs> slide. So that was okay. good. Thank you so much. So everyone, um, we're going to do all the questions at the end. So please, you can start typing your questions now or you can um, do them at the end. But I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker. 
Sandy Chan. Um, Sandy, is, Ms. Chan is a retired academic librarian, the former president of the Arizona State Genealogical Society, and volunteered for nine years at the Arizona Historical Society's Library and Archives in Tucson. In 2015, she had an article published on a gentleman named Ah Wong in the Journal of Arizona History. She has given numerous presentations on the history of Tucson's Chinese community and on the Chinese railroad workers. In addition, she has a website, The History of Tucson's Chinese Community. You can find that at sandychan.net, which also includes information on the railroad workers. She is the recent winner of the 2023 Arizona Humanities Friend of the Humanities Award. So please welcome Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see here. Get my presentation started. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the building of the Southern Pacific Railroad through Arizona and its Chinese railroad workers. Our story, however, is going to start in Southeast China. Southeast China is where almost all of the Chinese that emigrated to the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries came from. And the big city that we're going to talk about is Hong Kong. So why would all these people come to the United States in the 19th and early 20th centuries? because the situation in China was dire. There was overpopulation. There was ecological disruptions. They had floods, they had droughts. Uh, because there was so many people, fields eroded. So they were having trouble feeding all the people in China. Then there was a famine. There was multiple famines. Let me be clear about that. The famine we're interested in is 1876 to 1879. Um, nine and a half million people died. And this exactly overlaps the uh, building of both the Northern and Southern Pacific railroads. So now you've got a weakened population, plague set in. And the really terrible part was there is no government to help anybody. The government had disintegrated at all levels. So when you have a situation this dire in a country, the uh, vultures start to circle. There are two things uh, that happened during 19th century that are important for our story. One is the Taiping Rebellion. Taiping Rebellion um, killed over 20 million people and it started in Southeast China. So this, and it went on for 14 years. It was, it was one of the major political uprisings in China in the 19th century. Now the first Opium War um, is the other thing that we need to talk about. First Opium War started because, the, because Great Britain wanted to force China to buy opium. That's right, they wanted to force them to buy opium and they won. And when they won, they got Hong Kong. This did two things. First of all, it provided like a release mechanism for people to exit China um, out into other countries. And this is where most of the Chinese that came from the United, that came from China into the United States came from and into Mexico too. And the other thing was it now became part of the, um, British Empire. So Chinese flowed out into Australia, into New Zealand, into parts of the Caribbean too. So this was a release valve for much of the 19th century in China. In the United States, the big, the big thing that happened was in 1848, California gold rush. This was an international phenomena. And for the Chinese, it was a perfect opportunity to work go to Gold Mountain, which was California, to get money to support their families back in China. Now, the first railroad that the Chinese worked on was um, is in 1858, but there was really no big splash that happened. There wasn't like a big deal. What we think of as the classic age of Chinese railroad building was 1865 to 1883. And this is when the Chinese worked on all three of the Western building, all three of the major Western railroads. So let's talk about the railroads for a minute. We know about the first transcontinental railroad. There was also a Northern Pacific Railroad, but we're going to talk about Southern Pacific Railroad, which took about 10 years to build. In Arizona alone, there was five to 6,000 Chinese, all total, that built the railroad. 
There was about 1,200 at any one time. And many of the men were veterans of the first transcontinental railroad. So we had a very experienced crew that was working on building the railroad through Arizona. Now the first routes that were proposed were actually proposed right after the Gadsden Purchase occurred. This is from 1857. This is the early line that most closely re resembles what was finally built. This is the international boundary with Mexico. This is the San Pedro River Valley. And this little red dot is Tucson. This is the railroad as it was actually built. We're going to spend most of our time talking about Casa Grande through Tucson and out into New Mexico. The orange here from just east of the Pantano Station to the Dragoon Summit was the most difficult part of the railroad in the entire state of Arizona to build. So this took a huge amount of time compared to the other parts of the railroad. Now, the original plan was the Southern Pacific comes from California, Texas Pacific comes from Texas, they meet at the Colorado River, they have a big party, everybody's happy. Okay, that did not happen. May of 1877, the Southern Pacific arrived across from Yuma, the Texas Railroad was still in Texas, that's not going to work. So the Southern Pacific sensed a gray area having to do with the Colorado River, so they continued to work and they built a bridge across the Colorado River. Well, big surprise, in September of 1877, without authority, Southern Pacific crosses the river and enters Yuma. This set off a huge uproar. It started in Congress. Congress referred to the problem to the territorial govern governors of um, Arizona and New Mexico. And within 14 months, Problem was solved, November 1878, Southern Pacific leaves Yuma. Southern Pacific headed to the east along what is now Interstate 8. <clears throat> Took a little blip up to a little community called Maricopa and then came down. And in late May of 1879, the work stopped in Casa Grande. It stopped for two reasons. One, they outran their supply lines. So they didn't have enough railroad ties or tracks. They, they couldn't keep up with the pace of the work. The other reason was the heat. It was starting to get hot and it was just too much for the men and the animals. Now the photo on the left is actually from Nevada, but it most closely resembles what you would have seen in Arizona. Wide, flat, open spaces, minimal vegetation. Look how straight this railroad is with some mountains in the background. And when they were building the railroads, they were also putting, they were also stringing the telegraph lines. Now, in Southern Arizona, 1880 was the year of the railroad. In January, an advanced party of 300, and chi 300 Chinese arrived in Tucson. The railroad could work on a line 20 to 40 miles long. So the advanced party of Chinese arrived in Tucson early because Tucson was the main hub in Southern Arizona for the railroad. February, they've already got Chinese workers out in the Sienica Creek. March 20th is the official date the Southern Pacific officially, officially arrived in Tucson. April 15th, they're still working out in the Sienega, quote from the Arizona Weekly Star. In the Sienega, a large number of China men are exchanged, are engaged excavating as they as they, they there encounter considerable elevation through which cuts have to be made and the grade has to be raised a number of feet above the low marshy ground. June 1880, 850 workers are enumerated for the census out in the Sienega. They are still slogging away out there. But they made it through, and by the end of September, the railroad was in New Mexico. Now, after 1880, there was still activity in the railroads. 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. This is the only law that was passed by Congress specifically excluding a, a targeted group of people, and that was the Chinese. 1883, work finished on the Northern and Southern Pacific lines. This is no coincidence. Once they figured out the railroads did not need any more Chinese labor to come in from China, they cut it off. Now, 1880 through 1887, there were considerable continual washouts along the Sienega Creek. At its heart, the Southern Pacific Railroad was a freight train. 
It did carry passengers, but it was really a freight train. And when you continually disappoint your major customers like the mines, you're going to start to have some problems. So 1887 comes along, and it's a bad year for the railroads. There were two Jesse James style train robberies near the Pantano station. And this is Doc Smart and the gang. And on the second robbery, they derailed the engine for the train, which was a huge problem. In May, um, there was a major earthquake in northwestern Mexico. This earthquake knocked the tracks out of alignment. And you also had a lot of rock falls over the, the railroad lines. So this was a huge problem, too. September, they had a major washout. Timbers from the Cienega Creek washed out down to Fort Lowell. So they had to wash out of the Cienega into the Pantano. It ran along the front face, the western face of the Rincons, the Rin uh, and the Pantano Wash. Pantano Wash at the confluence of the Pantano and the Rito is Fort Lowell. So th these timbers had to, and these are huge pieces of wood, go over 30 miles down three different water waterways to get to there. So they finally gave up, 1888, hundreds of Chinese are back and spent months rebuilding the entire track through the Cienega. This is one of the berms that the Chinese built. This was to help deflect the flood waters away from the track. The lower photo, the trees that are here are actually the trees that are here at the top of the berm. And you'll notice that there's quite a bit of um, space under this track. They really lifted the, the track along certain ways. This is still a living railroad track, by the way. Trains still travel along here all the time. So who were the men that built the railroad? Now, one of the things everybody talks about with the Chinese railroad workers is that they work for a dollar a day. So what I did was I calculated in the inflation calculator what a dollar a day in 1880 would have been in 2021. And that is a $29.05. So average worker, dollar a day, minus the cost of food, six days a week, 52 weeks a year. Now I took out 25% for the food. I have never seen any cost estimates of what they took out for food, but I figured could be a little more, could be a little less. So in 2021 money, they earned $6,797.70 per year on the railroad. Cooks and skilled craftsmen earn more, but I don't know how much more. I've never seen, is it 10% more, 50% more? Don't know. Why would people work for a dollar a day? Well, we know what the conditions were in China. So these people really needed to work to support their families. Now, with the railroad, unless you were injured or killed, you could have chances of long-term employment. And even after 1883, Chinese continued to be used on building railroads throughout the United States. And the big thing was that in the United States, they had a chance. They had no chance in China. So they were willing to work for the chance to save themselves and their families working on the railroads. What kind of work did they do? In Arizona, they started early in the morning and they broke it around 11 o'clock. They gave the men and the animals about three and a half hours to rest. And then the break was uh, ended at about 2.30 in the afternoon and everybody would go back to work until near dark. There was numerous crews on the railroad. Um, the brush burners were the, actually the people that burned the brush. They would go ahead of where the train was being built and they would clear out all of the brush out of the way. This is not a big deal in Arizona. It was a huge deal up on the Northern lines. Graders, this was the largest Chinese crew. These were the men that had to level the track so the train could go across. Trains back then couldn't take much of a grade, so they had to be almost completely flat. Following up were the Gandhi dancers, and the gentleman in the photo on the right are part of the Gandhi dancer crew. There were two Chinese Gandhi dancers. Their job was to align the tracks so they were e even, and then they would put what is known as a fish plate on either side, bolt them down to keep the track steady. And then there was wave after wave of follow-up crew, um, putting in more bolts, tightening bolts. They did what they had to do to make the line as solid as possible because they did not want anything to happen to the construction train. Once the line was solid, they felt 
confident that the construction, uh, the construction train could move forward, they moved it forward. Construction train was the administrative center for the entire railroad. It also carried all the supplies from nuts and bolts down to food. Now the Arizona Sentinel was the Yuma newspaper. When the railroad left Yuma, um, they sent reporters to report back to the readers in Yuma what was going on building the railroad. And so some of the only reports we have of the Chinese working on the railroad through Southern Arizona are from the, Yuma, Yuma, are from the Arizona Sentinel, the Yuma paper. And um, let me read this for you. This tells you about the American workers too. The Chinese are crowded there and work with monotonous industry that reminds one of the ant. These men appear to be neither happy nor miserable, just stolid and indifferent. It is plain that they move dirt more slowly than the white man, but as they have no pipes to fill and no political reforms to discuss, they manage to get a fair day's work done before night falls. Now, we've got all these men working, they're burning brush, they're leveling land, they need support. There were cooks. The Chinese demanded Chinese food and Chinese cooks. Each Chinese crew of about 12 to 20 workers had their own cook. The American cook also had six assistant Chinese cooks who would help him cook food for the American workers. The Chinese, uh, there was also tea and water boys. The Chinese drank tea, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There were animal handlers. There were hundreds of horses um, that were used to build the railroad. These horses needed to be fed and watered and handled also. And then there were blacksmiths and other skilled trades. So let's talk a little bit about health and wellness. Now, we talked about how they had tea boys. The Chinese drank lukewarm tea instead of plain water. This had two advantages. First, it boiled the water. We know you have to boil water to get tea. This sanitized the water. So the water was much cleaner than what the Americans were drinking. Now we know too that tea has antioxidants. So tea is a much more healthful drink. So the Chinese were drinking weak tea. Now the Chinese ate Chinese food. The food was bought from one of the supply cars on the, on the construction train. It was called the China store. This is where all the Chinese food and all of the Chinese uh, cookware and all of this was kept. Chinese ate, uh, and this is gonna sound very familiar, starch, vegetable, and protein. The starches were noodles and rice. And I believe that they probably used the cheapest rice available, which was unhulled brown rice. Unhulled brown rice is also healthier. It's more nutritious than the plain white rice that we eat today for the most part. They would have a vegetable. Vegetables could be mushroom. They could be seaweed. Um, all of the foods for the Chinese were packaged in China and sent over. Uh, protein, same thing. They would eat fish, um, shellfish, tofu. All of this was available from the China store. So Chinese were eating Chinese food like you would get in a Chinese restaurant. The food was served hot and fresh. And this is important. Um, a lot of the American food, there was about 150 American workers and there was a huge amount of food. They ate fried chicken, they ate Boston beans, they ate apple pies, and they spent the entire day cooking. So food would be cooked and set aside. And that's, that's, a, you know, that's a way to get salmonella and some other problems with your food. Chinese didn't have that problem. Their food hot and fresh, and they ate family style. Now the photo on the right obviously is not Chinese railroad workers. It is a photo of one American and several Chinese officers during World War II in Burma. Here we have a group of men in rough surroundings eating family style and eating Chinese food. Notice each man has a rice bowl. Their food is served in the center. They serve themselves like you would at your own dinner table. They are eating as a group. And then they've got something here to keep the food off the ground. So they do have, um, so this is the closest that I could find to what the Chinese railroad workers would have looked like eating their meals. Now the Chinese were also cleaner than the Americans. They bathed on a regular basis. It's not unusual for the workers to come after a hot day working, you know, digging dirt. They would clean, clean up a little. They would change their clothes. 
They wash their clothes on a regular basis. If you see photos of railroad camps, you will see the Chinese slept in these tents. And on the tents, you can see clothes laid out to dry. You can see clothes on bushes. The Americans thought this was weird. They found it effeminate and suspicious that the Chinese were always bathing. And I honestly think I would rather be in a Chinese camp than an American camp, given the heavy work these men were doing. Health. Now, the contract stated that the Chinese doctors had to be in the area of the track. I don't know how they would do this in Arizona. Um, Chinese medicine at the time, we think of acupuncture now as Chinese medicine. Back then, the big thing was pulsology. So you would have somebody who is ill, they would go to a doctor, they would take their pulse, and the doctor would then diagnose the illness and prescribe the appropriate medications from their pulse. Now, the Chinese did use herbal medications on the railroad. They could have brought them from China, or they could have gotten them in San Francisco. One medication I'm pretty sure they would have used was very popular in the 19th century, and that is opium. Opium is a central nervous system depressant, and um, that means it dulls pain. I could see where people would be in pain after working on the railroad. It also stops vomiting and diarrhea. A lot of the 19th century diseases involved like cholera, vomiting and diarrhea, anything that you could do to suppress those two things and person could stay hydrated, they had a better chance of survival. Now recreation, uh, it wasn't all hard work. They did have some leisure time. And the recreation that the, that the Chinese did was very similar to what the Americans would do. For example, the Chinese would play a game called Go. This is a Go board with some of the Go chips. Um, Americans would play checkers. Everybody gambled in the 19th century. It didn't make any difference what color you were. Gambling was really popular. They smoked opium. Opium was not just a medication. It was a relaxant. Um, not all Chinese smoked opium, probably 20 to 25% of the Chinese would have smoked opium, and some would have smoked it for the pain reducing properties too. The Americans, however, would have drunk whiskey. People sang songs, listened to music, wrote home, so it's very similar. Recreation time was very similar. So what happened after the railroad was built? Well, if you were a Native American, it wasn't too good. With the coming of the railroad, um, the army could quickly and efficiently move troops around to fight the Native Americans. Um, this is particularly deadly for the Northern Plains tribes, but it was also deadly for Native Americans in Southern Arizona. The major uh, Indian Wars fort in Southern Arizona was Fort Bowie. It was only about 15 miles from the railroad track. By 1886, Geronimo had surrendered and he was put on a train built by the Chinese railroad workers, the tracks, and he was exiled to Florida and then wound up in Oklahoma. Now mining boomed. Once the mines were freed from the tyranny of the mule trains, mining towns like Bisbee and Tombstone prospered. They could get huge equipment into these places and they could take out large amounts of ore to be processed. Smaller mines did well too. For example, there's two small mines in the Santa Rita's, the Total Wreck and Helvetia mines, um, that shipped their ore out of Vail. So at all levels, mining prospered. And industrialized cattle ranching also prospered. Overgrazing occurred and many places have never recovered. I was truly shocked when I found this statistic. 1870s, there was about 40,000 cattle in the state of Arizona. 1890s, 1.5 million cattle. Um, this is huge. Now, there was a cost to ship these cattle. This wasn't for free. Um, the high cost of shipping cattle led to sporadic cattle drives in protest of the cost to ship the cattle. 1889 and 1898, there were drives that left from Wilcox that went into uh, New Mexico, like Lordsburg or something. They were, they were just little protest drives. In 1890, Warner Ranch had a major cattle drive from the ranch in Southern Arizona to their ranch in Southern California, the Warner Ranch. 
The reason they um, did the drive was because the railroad raised the rates to ship the cattle 25%, and they just did not want to pay that, and you can't blame them. Now, towns grew. Tucson changed from a Mexican town into an American city. It is, um, um, the Tucson we live in today is because of the railroad. The town of Benson was born. Benson was the main point on the main line for uh, the, the mines down around Tombstone. So there was a lot of ore and a lot of, a lot of stuff came up from that particular part of the state. Wilcox was born. In the 1930s, Wilcox was known as the cattle capital of the world. It shipped more cattle out than any place else in the world. And um, Wilcox is very nicely placed for this. To the north of Wilcox, you've got the enormous Sierra Bonita Ranch owned by the Hooker family. To the south, you had another equally enormous ranch, the San Bernardino owned by John Slaughter. Between these two ranches, you also had numerous ranches in Cochise County, including the Riggs Ranch, which is just south of um, Bowie. So this, uh, this, um, this was a really hopping place for a long, long time. But now we are at the end of our story and we are at the present. And this is what it looks like now. These are modern trains traveling. This is a train traveling over the trestle out at the Sienega Creek. This is a rail, this is a, this is a bridge for cars. Again, this is a engine of engines basically, but again, this is down south of um, where the Sienega is now. And here's another shot from again, in the area around the Sienega Creek. And we are at the end of the presentation. Wow, thank you so much, Sandy. That was wonderful. And again, please, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat and we will get to all of them at the end. Um, so our final presenter is Robin Blackwood. Robin will be talking about Chinese merchants in Tucson. Um, Robin is a retired naval officer and lawyer with a lifelong interest in Chinese language and culture, graduating from University of California at Berkeley with an AB degree in Oriental languages, emphasis on Chinese. She is a long-standing member of the Historic Committee, History Committee of the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center, TCCC. Robin has organized and presented symposia, lectures, history tours, oral histories, and other programs for TCCC. In 2013, she organized a 600-square-foot exhibit at the annual Tucson Meet Yourself Folk Life Festival called Tucson Chinese Sharing Stories. In 2016, she produced an ambitious schedule of programs promoting the 10-week run of the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition, I Want the Wide American Earth, an Asian Pacific American Story. And that was an incredible exhibit and programming. A banner ex exhibition depicting the history of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders. She continues to promote the history of the Chinese people of Tucson, most recently with a TCCC project on the Chinese. In Tucson Urban Renewal in 1968, in partnership with units of the University of Arizona, Robin is a past recipient 2012 of the Outstanding Community Service Award of the Asian American Faculty, Staff, and Alumni Association of the University of Arizona. Please welcome Robin. Thank you. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Let's see if I can get my screen sharing going. And put it on slideshow. Can you see it? The building that you are looking at is, is the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center. And uh, it is the most visible representation of our historic Chinese community in Tucson. It is a 9,000 square foot facility with a commercial kitchen, multi-purpose room, classrooms, 
parking, an outdoor space that's partially covered that's appropriate for festivals and other activities. And so we have to ask ourselves, with these kinds of activities going on all the time, uh, sponsored by the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center, how did we get to the point where this community could uh, have as its home this impressive uh, facility? So I like to work from a little scribbled timeline that I keep because it helps me keep track of the people and how they came. We don't have time today to talk about everybody who's listed in these little timelines I've included, but um, it helps to understand that it was a whole little community of people from the very beginning. In the very beginning, it was just a few little people, but uh, it, it, and it, and for a long time, it was very small, but it was a community. They worked together and they also got along well with their neighbors. And it's important to keep that in mind as we talk. So the 1870 census showed no Chinese in Tucson. By the mid 1870s, there was a Chinese restaurant that had opened there. I want to refer you to Sandy Chan's excellent website, sandychan.net. She's got a little advertisement from what was probably that restaurant that is, is on her webpage. And then in 1879, a man named Sing Lee began selling beans, whiskey, and jerky in Tucson. Uh, he was pretty successful. He also did a lot of trade down in Mexico. For a few years, he moved down there and then came back. So in 1880, the 1880 census shows a Tucson population of 7,000 people and a Chinese population, almost all men, of about 180. In 1881, Chan Tin Wo, also called Chin Tin Wo by Grace Delgado in her important book, Making the Chinese Mexican, uh, opens his business, which he advertised as provisions plus almost anything you could want. And then as Sandy mentioned in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act passed. That was very important and, and important in the history of mercantilism, I think, in Tucson, because it excluded from entry into the United States, all Chinese except, oh, diplomats and students and uh, visitors and merchants. And merchants were defined as having a fixed place of business that was run on a regular basis. And the proprietor did not do any manual labor except that which was necessary to keep the business running. I don't know quite how you separate that from some of the other things, but it was clear from the beginning that grocers were merchants. This is what the town looked like then. This is uh, a shot of Meyer Street taken from the Palace Hotel. Uh, you can notice uh, the Sonoran style architecture and you can notice, of course, the dirt streets. Now, in the early 1880s, some Chinese men uh, leased land from property owners, uh, including Leopoldo Carrillo, to grow fruits and vegetable market. This is on, mostly on the western bank of the Santa Cruz River. And um, uh, that became a pretty uh, important enterprise because what they would do is they would, they became known as the produce providers for the little town. Prior to that, most of the Mexicans who, who were growing produce around the Santa Cruz were doing it for subsistence. And there wasn't the kind of market for the kind of kind of elegant vegetables and fruits. So they brought them into the city to sell on wagons early in the morning. And they would develop relationships with the Tucson families who purchased their produce. There is uh, a wagon of the type that they used that is on display at the Chinese Garden at Mission Garden, if any of you are in Tucson and able to go look at it. In 1885, there was a water rights case in territorial court. 
involving these gardening practices, uh, Dalton versus Carrillo. And there was an objection that was made that the Chinese were using too much water. However, the landlords, including Perio, won the case. So the Chinese were able to continue to uh, do their produce, their produce truck farming and bring it into town. Around 1887, a man named Li Goon arrives in Tucson. We're gonna talk about Li Goon, so I will highlight him. Now in 1890, there were about 210 Chinese in Tucson. So you can see that um, uh, the population had grown. And in 1892, the Gary Act passes, it just made the, China, it made the Chinese Exclusion Act permanent. And it also added the requirement that all Chinese had to carry a photo ID at all times. Uh, this is the first episode and the most prominent episode of anything like this happening to uh, an ethnic group in the United States. And it also was a model for the kinds of immigration uh, paperwork that we've had ever since. In some parts of Arizona, particularly the mining parts, there was a lot of pretty overt anti-Chinese uh, sentiment. Um, Bisbee and Tombstone both had uh, a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment and Bisbee actually uh, passed an ordinance that required all Chinese to be out of town by dusk and not come back until dawn. Some type of restrictive ordinance of this type was suggested in Tucson and was rejected in 1893. There was significantly less um, anti-Chinese sentiment throughout. 1895, Don Chun Wo, another very important community member arrives in Tucson, we can't talk about him. In 1896, Hai Wo leaves Tucson this is kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that um, the next census, the 1900 census shows that in fact, the number of Chinese merchants had declined in Tucson. And um, Dan Chun Wo was part of that uh, movement. He had had a store in Tucson. Tucson Chinese Cultural Center has a ledger of his written in Chinese that dates from 1894. So we know he was, here then, but uh, he had seen Benson. Remember Sandy told you that uh, Benson was um, uh, founded as a result of the railroad being built out there. And uh, he decided that's where he wanted to end up. So he went out to Benson, opened a mercantile and that mercantile lasted about a hundred years, but uh, he was no longer in Tucson and he never really came back. Now by 1886, um, the, the building in the lower half of this map, which came off of uh, Sandy's website, uh, you see where the 213 is in the blank space. This was called the Welsh block. And you can see that it was just uh, right next to the Palace Hotel with Meyer Street on the right. So that um, you can see that um, it's, it's a very, um, an area that we've already seen or already familiar with. And this was uh, the property of um, a Jewish citizen whose name was Wellish. And um, it's going to be part of our story. So that's why I have brought it in here. So this is an early, you can see that on the left-hand side at the bottom, uh, which um, uh, was my main street, that um, there are buildings on the south, there are buildings at this point on the north side and the uh, east side, there are very few buildings, but um, that would get filled in later. So in uh, 1898, the US Supreme Court decides the Wong Kim Ark case, which was a case of a Chinese man born in the United States his parents were Chinese citizens. They had they returned to China. He went to visit them at some point when he was a young man and was denied re-entry. He fought the case all the way to the Supreme Court and it became a principal statement of the idea that um, of birthright citizenship uh, for everybody. And so um, that helped um, a number of 
Chinese citizens, both in Tucson and other places, because by this time, people had been living in San Francisco a long time. A lot of people were being born in the United States, and this really helped them get in and out of the United States. 1899, another important uh, figure that we don't have time for, uh, comes to Tucson, that's Don Hua. And then in 1900, uh, the census showed the Tucson population at 7,500 and the Chinese only about 177. So that during that period, um, the, the Chinese population had actually decreased. And I think it's just, you know, a number of factors. Um, by 1895, uh, Chan Tin Wo had, uh, who we talked about early on, uh, had left and gone back to China. And uh, we know that uh, Hai Wo had also left for totally different reasons. So there was probably, uh, there were probably a number of diverse reasons that they left. Uh, 1900, Chin Nok comes to Tucson. 1903, Lai Nan arrives in Nogales. 1907, Alice Jin's father arrives in Tucson. Sadly, we can't talk about any of these people, but we have fabulous stories that our community has put together about all of them. Um, then in 1910, the Chinese population of Tucson um, had increased to 224. So by this time it was growing and as Sandy mentioned, conditions were changing. In 1911, the Wellish block that we looked at previously in the Sanborns map was acquired by Chinese interests. In particular, it was acquired by the Hop Sing Tong, um, which had been formed recently before that. And so that block became a center of Chinese activity. If you're familiar with, um, with Tucson, it was between Meyer and Maine, south of Broadway and north of Jackson. And we'll talk more about the Wellish block later. 1912, Don Toy arrives. And then in also in 1912, Lee Goon, who we heard about in 1887, arriving in Tucson, opens the Lee Hop Market. Here it is. And um, it was probably um, a pretty classic market in the way that uh, we think of Chinese markets now. Typically, the Chinese family lived behind the store. And I know that there are apartments on the left side of the picture here. And uh, so the family was there. A lot of them spoke Spanish. Um, the, um, they catered to the local population. So if they had a butcher store, a lot of, the, uh, a lot of times they would make Mexican chorizo and we have come to call that Chinese chorizo just because it was made by Chinese grocers. And um, they typically had at the counter little treats for the kids that came by, Piloncio. In this particular case, the store was named uh, Li Hop after Li Gun's son. And um, Li Gun's granddaughter, Mary Lee Malaby, reports that she grew up in that store and that as soon as she was tall enough to get on a chair and access the cash register, they put her to work. This is a favorite family picture of Lee Goon. It's probably toward the end of his life, but it crops up in all the notes from the Lee family. And this is Lee Goon's carriage. Uh, interesting because there were already cars in Tucson in 1912, but Lee Goon favored a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage, and um, his granddaughter uh, records that he always rode around in it and it was drawn by a white horse. This uh, carriage is in working order. It belongs to the Tucson Rodeo Parade Committee and um, Tucson Chinese Cultural Center has sponsored it a few times in the rodeo parade. In 1932, Li Gun left Tucson and returned to China and he sold the store to his son, Lee Hop, for a dollar. Lee Hop ran it until 1943. In 1943, he 
passed it to his brother, Li Fao, who had arrived uh, at some point from China. And Li Fao and his family owned it until 1965. And this is what it looks like. It's looked like at some point during that period, same building. This is a picture of the Li Fao family in the store at, with Li Fao on the left. And um, I really like to uh, focus on this store because you can see that it's uh, life under Chinese ownership until 1965 when it left Chinese ownership. It's life uh, tracks the arc of the most successful period for Chinese grocers. Uh, in Tucson. So uh, starting in the 1920s, Sandy likes to date it, I know on her website from about 1916, but around that same period, um, more and more uh, Chinese merchants showed up in Tucson and opened grocery stores and they were quite successful. They were in all the old neighborhoods. We can only talk about a few today, sadly, but they were in uh, on Anita Street there was many as six Chinese grocers at one time. And in the Dunbar neighborhood, a historically black neighborhood, there ended up being as many as six Chinese grocers. They were all over town. And sometimes they were on multiple corners of the same intersection. And the high point seems to have been uh, just at the end of World War II through the first half of the 1950s. There were actually in the early 1950s, there were a few years when there were actually over a hundred Chinese grocery stores operating at the same time. And they were all a part of their neighborhood. And everybody in Tucson, when you encounter them at, at events, has a story to tell about their Chinese grocery. They were very well integrated into the community. But by the time the Li Hop Li Fao grocery store left Chinese ownership, uh, Tucson was really changing. Early in the 1960s, the voters of Tucson had authorized uh, an urban renewal project. And this project ended up destroying 96 acres of downtown uh, north of the store we've been talking about. But um, the southern boundary was Cushing Street. And it destroyed a vast amount of the history of Tucson, uh, Chinese, Black, Native American, and uh, Hispanic. And it at that time, the sorts of neighborhoods were considered to be um, urban blight. And that was how it was. So by the time of the destruction of uh, this 96 acres, the old Wellish block that we've looked at before had uh, ended up looking like this. This is the, this would be the Southwest corner of it. And then it continues on to the left out of the picture. Um, it was a center for paternal and benevolent organizations of the Chinese. It was a place where they went to have their, their holiday parties. Um, the Nationalist Party of China had offices there. The uh, Chinese Chamber of Commerce had an office there. There were numerous activities going on. Plus in the back in the area where they had filled in, um, there were rooms for boarders and a lot of the less well-off or, or even almost indigent Chinese men uh, lived in there. This was one of the things that was destroyed in urban renewal in 1968. Uh, the site is currently pretty much under the Linda Ronstadt Music Hall, if you're familiar with Tucson. This is an Arizona State Museum photo. We are current, we, Tucson Chinese Cultural Center is currently working on a Tucson urban renewal project with Arizona State Museum and uh, the Center for Digital Humanities at the university, plus other community partners. Uh, and there will be uh, around town in a few months, 
some augmented reality sites at various locations that bring an experience uh, of photos and other uh, videos and, and other augmented reality stuff um, to sites around town. People will be able to use their cell phones to access them. There will be one of these sites at, um, at uh, Tucson Convention Center on, on one of the kiosks, assuming it gets approved this afternoon because they're working on that this afternoon at the Preservation Committee. <clears throat> so um, stay tuned. The official kickoff for that project is uh, August 30th at the university, but there will be uh, publicity uh, later in the fall. Now, the, the building that had been Li Hop and Li Fao continued to go on, uh, not under Chinese ownership. And in 2012, it turned 100 years old and we gave it a birthday party. So um, we arrived in a bus and we brought food for anybody who dropped by and we brought youth ballet folklorico and youth mariachi. And of course we brought our fabulous lion dancers and that picture was taken there. Uh, that same day, this is a picture of Mary Lee Malaby, the granddaughter of Lee Boone, her husband, George Malaby, in front of the fabulous carriage. Another picture taken the same day, this is Mary, of course, and next to Mary is uh, her cousin, Tony Lee, who was a member of Lee Fowles' family, and um, his daughter on the far left, and one of his sons, and assorted spouses. But meanwhile, there's more to this story. Um, I should mention, by the way, I have to mention, by the way, before I go on, the, uh, the store, the family that was running the store lost it in uh, a default, a mortgage default, a few years after we were there in 2012. Uh, TCCC made an attempt with a lot of help from Damien Klinko at Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation to acquire the store, but we weren't able to do it. So now it just sits down there and it's at um, 1600 South 9th Avenue, I believe. Let me get that. Yes. 1600 South 9th Avenue. If you want to go down and look at it, it's just all boarded up. It looks sad. But meanwhile, uh, this is Lee Shaman, and Lee Shaman was actually Lee Goon's father, and he showed up in Tucson not later than 1899, and he and Lee Goon uh, were able to get a hold of a, uh, a building at 600 South Meyer Street, which is also below the urban renewal, so the building is still there, and um, after a few years, they were able to buy it. It was opened in the name of the Li Long Sing Market. Oops. So, uh, okay. So Li Shaman uh, worked in that market until he died in 1918, at which point it was taken over by his son, Li Ho. This is an immigration picture of Li Ho around the time he was around 31 years old, around the time that he took over management of the market. This, uh, this building looks like this today. It still exists, 600 South Meyer Street, well worth a trip down just to take a look. And it was remodeled, I understand it. The facade was remodeled by the current owners, who I believe are an engineering firm, um, to mimic what it looked like when it was first built. It had been remodeled a number of times uh, in order to keep up with um, architectural fads, um, but it became a, an extremely popular grocery store. On the side of it, you could see that there was an important mural. The mural shows right in the middle, uh, the Lee Ho grocer and the man with the glasses in the middle is Lee Ho, and the man just to the right of him is Jerry Lee. So when Lee Ho uh, left the picture, Jerry Lee 
took over the store and he named it Jerry's Lee Home Market. And I have to say that it's just legendary. Um, people loved it. And um, uh, this is from a family set of photos and they're very proud, the great grandson that put it all together is very proud that the bag they're holding up, um, some of it is in Spanish. They were very pleased that they could deal so effectively with their with their Spanish speaking neighbors. And that's uh, uh, Jerry Lee on the right. In uh, the, the Lee family uh, quit the business around 1960 and uh, it was acquired by another Chinese couple, Sui Ji and his wife. And in 1980, um, they had a historical American building survey done on the building. And um, that survey is in the Library of Congress. And uh, this is what the building looked like at that time. So you can see how it has had various uh, iterations and designs over the years, but it was extremely successful. And it actually operated as a grocery store until 2002. This is um, the storyboard, by the way, for Jerry's Lee Home Market that is in the collection at the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center. And um, there are about 40 plus storyboards there. The families decide if they want one and they are available to view if you can't come into the center. They're available to view on www.tucsonchinese.org slash endowment. Well, so after urban renewal, things were really changing. People had cars, people had refrigerators. They didn't have to go to the grocery store all the time. Um, they didn't need to go every day. There were supermarkets and um, gradually, during the 60s and the 70s, most of them went away, but a few hung on. This is um, TNT, which was very, very historic and only went out of business in 2016. Okay, this is a piece of living history. And this is where I'm going to ask uh, Alicia if she'll put a little note up in the chat. This is the new empire market. To my knowledge, it is still in business and uh, Mrs. Lee and one of her sons are running it. We brought our rolling history project to them uh, in 2012 and um, these pictures were taken in 2012. Notice that um, it had a neon sign that was in great disrepair then that has since been fixed and is actually beautiful. We don't have much time to talk about this because I'm sure I'm running over already. But um, this was taken in the store. This is Tun Lee, the owner on the far left and his wife right in the middle. And uh, because we don't have this, but this is a very historic building. This started out as Joe Tang's market in the 1930s and then was acquired by Soling Tom's company, uh, the Empire Company. And then Tun Lee acquired it uh, in about 1959. We did, which is to say TCCC, did an oral history of him in 2012 of Tun Lee. And I think it's just fabulous. We did it in the store. You could see people coming and going. And he talked a whole lot about his history, his life, how he acquired the store, what its meaning was. And also his wife, who, is, who has a great personality, is also featured in there. So um, hopefully Alicia can put that link up in the chat. And if you cannot, get to the empire market, the new empire market yourself, you can look at the oral history. Now, I'd, I'd like to just circle back on the way to, uh, to ending. Uh, remember Sing Lee, uh, who we started with in 1879, uh, he eventually came back from Mexico and had a store in uh, Tucson again. And at some point early in the 20th century, Wang Yen acquired his store and named it the Yen Sing Li Market. And he outgrew it. So he moved across the street to this fabulous building uh, where he raised his family. And this is the inside of what the building looked like in the 20s. 
Um, this is a whole nother story, and this is why I want to circle back, but then leave us here, because this was one of the families that ended up buying property out in the north in Marana and um, uh, starting to cotton farm. And that is a whole nother aspect of the history of the Chinese in Tucson, but this family remains <laughs> an important part of the Chinese community in Tucson, as do they all. And as so, thank you very much. I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you, everyone. If we can give like a virtual round of applause for all our presenters, it was such a fascinating panel of speakers and I'm so excited. And we do have some questions and you can continue to provide your questions. Um, I'll I'll just start with the ones that have been posted. Um, one of the first ones that came in was for Sandy um, and Carolyn actually wanted to, you know, Carolyn Claussen, she was wondering how much less were the Chinese cooks paid than the white cooks and how much less were the Chinese railroad, railroad workers paid? We don't know. There are no records. The way the Chinese were paid is they were they were paid in a group. So when the, the pay receipts were given, they were made out to the foreman of the group. And then within the group, the pay was dispersed. So we don't know really how much exact people earned. So the cooks would have earned more than the regular laborers, the Chinese cooks, but I suspect the American cook earned more money than the Chinese cook did. Thanks, Sandy. Yes, and then um, Kristen, Donna was wondering, do you have a list that you can share of other books besides the one you've written on the Tucsonians and Hirabayashi? I was just looking for a biography um, that Gordon's nephew wrote about him, and then so I'll post that. Um, but about the Tucsonians, I think mine is the only one. But the Densho um, uh, online encyclopedia is a great resource, and so I'll post um, Densho's encyclopedia that has articles about the Tucsonians, the um, about Gordon Hirabayashi, and also the biography. But I, I'll pull those up real quick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the Densho has a lot of great oral histories on things. Exactly. And actually the um, oral histories that I conducted are available. Um, the digital audio recordings are available through the University of Arizona. So I could put that on there as well. Oh my gosh. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Kristen. Um, Robin, Kirsten, uh, uh, Carolyn was wondering, is the Empire Market on 9th Street in Tucson? Oh, yes. Let me get you the address. <laughs> so the address is 526 E. East 9th Street, it's in the Iron Horse neighborhood. It's just east of 4th Avenue on 9th Street. And you can't miss it. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Tim for Kirsten. And he was wondering, in Gordon Hirabayashi's writings, did he ever record any detailed stories about his hitchhiking and whom he met along the way? Did he remark on any noteworthy interactions or people he met? So um, yes, he talks about being uh, picked up by a police officer in Utah and about how the police officer nearly drove off the road when he told him, yeah, I'm hitchhiking to turn myself in to serve a prison term. Um, so that's the, the biggest one. Um, there are some letters that he wrote back to a, a former girlfriend of his that are housed at the University of Washington where he did talk about going to visit leaders of the JACL in Salt Lake City. Um, so those are the most notable examples. Yeah, and I think I remember that when he arrived, um, they didn't know what to do with him with his papers. Is that right, Kristen? They didn't have any record of the fact that he was supposed to turn himself in. And so mm -hmm. they said, go, go get some lunch, go watch a movie, go stay out of the heat, go stay cool and then come back. Um, and he said the same thing about that, that he got quite a kick out of realizing later that he was in the exclusion zone, exactly what he was trying to protest. And they told him, just go, you know, help yourself, go to lunch. <laughs> yeah. So his story, um, I think I think probably the most accessible version of that might be through Densho. Thank you. Um, and then we also had a question from Tim for Sandy. 
Did any of the Chinese workers who built the railway become career employees of the railroad and write about it or have their stories told? No, not, not that we know of. Um, people wrote letters back to China, but a lot of those were destroyed during the Chinese revolution of the 50s and 60s. Um, there are people in Tucson that are descended from railroad workers, but nobody has really written, um, really written um, in depth about that. Um, uh, Robin mentioned um, Chan Tin Wu. He was reputedly a railroad worker who came to Tucson in about 1879 to, to act as a translator in a uh, court case. And he was one of the most important early men, not only in the Chinese community, but in the overall community of Tucson too. So um, it, there's just not a lot known. I mean, that's the frustrating thing is that they really didn't keep records. Uh, they don't know exactly how many people worked on the railroad. They don't know how many people died on the railroad. They have estimates, but they don't know they don't know a lot of specifics, which is kind of frustrating given all the men that did work on the railroad. Thank you so much. Um, Anna mentions that Joe Tang and Paul Don were two of the grocer men who had chains of stores in Tucson in the 40s and 50s. Oh, yes. They're, I mean, it's a very, a very rich history full of many stories and many people. It's kind of frustrating not to be able to do it justice, but I know I ran over, so I did the best I could. Oh no, that was great. That was wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Well, could I could I say something in response to that question? Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem with with the Tucson Chinese community is that people don't realize how important their stories are. You know, they just they had a business, they went in and they worked hard, um, but they don't they don't really realize that what they were doing is, is was important, and the stories are important too to share. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. I mean, it goes to the public history work that Kristen's doing and all the oral histories you're collecting. So, so important, yes. Um, Kim had a question for Robin. Can't wait for the augmented reality events. <laughs> Could you describe uh -huh. the viewer experience a little more? <laughs> oh, okay, so um, this project is called Discovering Community in the Borderlands. And um, there is a website that's still being built, but you can still get some good stuff out of it even now. It's um, uh, uh, https colon backslash backslash uh, dcb.arizona.edu. And it, there are five or six community partners. Um, Mission Garden is a partner. Borderlands Theater is a partner. Pasqua Yaki Nation is a partner. Dunbar Pavilion is a partner. And we're a partner. And each of the locations um, has a, a QR code. And <clears throat> what you can access depends on what that community chose to emphasize. So we had an early, we TCCC had an early phase. We were one of the initial phases kind of a guinea pig. Uh, it's, it's student developers that are doing the AR work. And so we had a 360 video and we have um, a, a young lady pay, playing the Gucci and a fabulous poem that wraps around her and um, some excerpts out of a Chinese class. And that's all available already at Tucson Chinese Cultural Center. And there are excerpts available on the website, which is still being developed. For this purpose, what's interesting is that Borderlands Theater has its up and it has a Tucson Chinese history on the west side uh, embedded in it. It features um, a gallery and an interview that is voiced by an actress, but it's Patsy Lee. So, and, and it's Alan's market, it's their market. And it's, it's really cool. So now we have a phase where we're exploring the Tucson urban renewal. And what we're supposed to have happening is that um, when you um, put your phone up to the QR code, that um, you're going to see a, a video that uh, was produced uh, by TCCC. 
And Tina Liao will tell you about this community uh, and how it was lost and what it was about. And then there will be links to uh, 3D uh, reproductions of some of the artifacts that are in the Arizona State Museum collection that came out of there. And um, there will also be uh, one of the letters that one of the people who lived in um, the Chinese block that we looked at before um, wrote back home to China and we will have a pop out of some translation just of a particular portion. And there will be a photo gallery and all you should get all that. And so hopefully that got approved today. And uh, the kickoff is at the university library on um, August 30th from four to 6 p.m. But realizing that um, the big time in Tucson is in the fall, there's gonna be a lot of publicity. So stay tuned for discovering community in the borderlands. And there'll be these little sites all over town, which will be pretty cool, I think. Thank you, Robin. And I wanna mention Kristen's been dropping a lot of the um, resources into the chat. If you didn't have it, maybe I hope um, maybe those can get sent out later. But then Sandy just provided a really interesting. This resource. is a project that I have been working on with the U of A. Robin and I are very busy with the U of A right now. And this, this is to do with racist covenants where um, various races were forbidden to buy homes in specific areas. This is one of several kinds of racist covenant site throughout the United States. They've got the basic skeleton of the site up, but the map and all of the uh, data will debut at the end of August. Thank you very much. Wow, fascinating. Yes, Kristen. And I just wanted to point out one of the things, it's not what I talked about, but um, I worked with the National Archives in Riverside when I was down in San Bernardino. Um, to digitize their Chinese exclusion case files. And the entire um, collection of from the file from Nogales is available online. And so that was the first thing I dropped in there. Um, and it's a wonderful collection of um, documents with um, full interviews with people. It primarily relates to Nogales. I haven't gone through it ex you know, extensively to see if there are any references to Tucson or anywhere else. Um, but it's interviews with people either trying to um, prove that they have enough resources to go to China and back um, during exclusion or trying to um, prove through interviews that they have merchant status. And in that, you also get these wonderful um, stories about where they're from, family members throughout the United States, describing locations where they worked or who they worked for in different locations um, in Arizona. And so you can get a lot of rich history um, and also photographs of people um, from around the 1920s uh, on through the 1960s. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you. I did have a quick question, Robin. Is Chinese trees, a, is it different than regular trees or are they just called it Chinese trees? <laughs> well, they just called it Chinese <laughs> trees. So, but um, there is on the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center website, um, an oral, not an oral history, a video that we did a long time ago now. It's probably 2011. And it's when we were uh, working with Grace Pena Delgado. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is the, uh, she moderates the, the video. And you can find it on the, on the TucsonChinese.org website under the history program. And um, thank you, Carolyn. She just <laughs> put it up in the chat under the history program. And uh, it's a whole maybe seven or eight minute video in which various um, people who were involved in, um, in Chinese grocery stores uh, talk about making the chorizo. And it's really pretty humorous and funny and interesting. And basically they said that at the end of every week, you'd have all these leftovers, right? So it could be the ends of, of bologna, or it could be hot dogs, or it could be any, it could be whatever. And then what you would do is you would grind it all up, and then you would season it just like uh, anybody would season their chorizo. And so, uh, and then it was sold, and it was very, very, very popular, very popular. Um, I don't know, but I've heard stories that people would come from far away, like out of town 
to buy Teresa with the Chinese grocery stores. <laughs> so um, it's well, the video is well worth watching. And there's a little bitty excerpted recipe also right there on the website. Um, when I used to have um, a member of the center who was willing to make Chinese chorizo for me, he would make it in these giant batches, like giant batches, 20 pounds of meat at a time, this kind of stuff. And so um, the little recipe that's in the that's on the website, I don't think does it justice. But to my knowledge, it was just chorizo uh, made by Chinese grocers. <laughs> Thank you. All right, were there any other questions? Um, if not, I just want to thank all of our presenters again. It was such a fabulous um, panel and so invigorating and interesting to hear all of your presentations. So thank you again. Thank you all. Um, and I'll turn things over to Alicia and Donna to wrap us up. Thank you again. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just a reminder that this is recorded. So I just put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat and we'll let you know when that's um, uploaded. The other update that we have is this upcoming Tuesday is our next book club event where we are discussing The City We Became by N.K. Jemison. Um, if you'd like to attend, even if you haven't finished the book yet, that's completely fine. Um, and you can check out our webpage for the um, link and stay tuned for our October book club as well. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.